All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Effective Resume Thursdays. We're very glad you're with us today. It is uh, February 17th, 2022. Please note this event is being recorded and is currently live on Facebook. The recording will be on the Career DFW Facebook page and the Career USA YouTube channel for others to view in the future. By participating in this event, you give consent for your name and picture to appear. Please note that any comments you put in the Zoom chat window will not appear in the recording. If you'd like to network with each other, you're welcome to put your personal contact information in there and uh, we can connect with each other so you can connect after the event offline. Uh, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please just open the chat window. The, uh, if you hover over the very bottom of the uh, screen, the uh, little bar should come up, just click on chat. And for those watching on Facebook right now, thank you for joining us. If you have any questions, yeah. just put your questions into the comment field. We are going to review one or two resumes at the end of this presentation live. You're welcome to submit your resume using the chat box. If you uh, click on file, where you see that blue arrow, you can click on that and you can attach your resume. Just send it to me. Just uh, look for Jeff Morris in the, uh, uh, where it says, instead of everyone, just select Jeff Morris. Uh, but please remember that we will, this will be out on YouTube and Facebook. So if you'd like to, please remove your header information so that, uh, you know, we don't share any of that information forever and ever. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jeff Morris. Back in 2008, I started a website called Career DFW to help those who are unemployed in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. In 2012, I started a second website, CareerUSA.org, to help those who were unemployed around the United States. I have written a book called What I've Learned About Your Job Search that you may not know. It is available on Amazon. Since 2007, I've been facilitating and leading the North Dallas Plano Career Focus Group. The group's been around since the late 1990s. I took it over in 2007. And I'll tell you about our program we have coming up tomorrow at the end of the session. And since 2017, I've been a member of the practice interview team. Lots, you spend a lot of time on your resume and a lot of time on LinkedIn. No resume no LinkedIn profile is gonna get you a job. All those two things do is they get you a phone call. Your phone call and your interviewing skills get you a job. So if you're not practicing, uh, you really need to do so. If you need some help, please reach out to me and I'll be glad to share information about the pit crew. Well, today our speaker is Aaron. He's the operation director at Next Step Recruiting. Uh, his beard is a little bit longer than what it was here in the picture, so uh, he needs to update his LinkedIn profile. <laughs> and uh, Aaron's going to share some resume awesome. tips. He and Carol presented uh, uh, last year a couple times or the prior couple years uh, in on you know on resumes. And Carol is no longer with us anymore. She passed away uh, December thirty first of two thousand and twenty one. And Aaron's agreed to come and speak today and. Uh, sort of fill in for her shoes. So uh, Aaron, thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to um, work, you know, work with you and work with everyone here and to share what I've learned about resumes and in just the, um, you know, couple decades I've been messing with this a little bit. So um, a little bit about me, um, since you've already gone over the Zoom tips, right? We'll get past that here. You guys figured that out already, it looks like. Sorry, I'm getting past here. A little bit about me. I'm a member of the Dallas chapter of, uh, since 2017 of the American Peril Association, National APA since 2019. I'm the website director currently of that organization and just was elected the president of the Lone Star chapter of the American Peril Association. I'm also a member of SHRM, which is the Society of Human Resource Management and the Dallas HR Group. I have 20 plus years in leadership in multiple industries and currently, as Jeff has mentioned, I am the Director of Operations uh, for Next Step Recruiting. We are a staffing service that provides both contract, contract to hire and direct hire placements. And in that, my responsibilities is payroll, corporate and field HR, accounting, admin, marketing, IT, and client delivery. Sounds like a lot, but uh, it gets me through the day anyway. All right. Um, the presentation is based off of work of Carol Burkell, CPCC. Um, as you may know, she was a 30-year uh, manager, hire, a recruiter, agency and corporate director. Uh, she actually was an incredible person and 
also served on the crew and was a coach. So I can't thank her enough for introducing me to the Dallas um, this career uh, group as well as to Jeff and just the opportunities to serve um, are there and I appreciate that. So let's go over our agenda a little bit here. Just gonna have a little bit of an opening discussion about what the toughest uh, question about your resume is, what you need to know about recruiters, both agency and, and corporate, a little bit about applicant tracking systems because I think you need to understand that as well. One page bios and the differences between bios and a resume, characteristics of a good resume, guidance regarding the key components of a resume. And then we're gonna summary and wrap up. And during that time, we'll look at some of the resumes if, if you've you know volunteered and we'll throw them as a team and see what we can do to help you out. All right. So what in the chat box, if you could just put, what's the toughest question you have about resumes? What's the toughest question you have about resumes? They haven't either, haven't been able to get an answer or the answer you have is a little ambiguous. Toughest question you have about resumes. I need to have background music. Da, 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 right. da, da, da. <laughs> Maybe there's no tough questions. Maybe there's just a question. It doesn't have to be tough. Any questions about resumes that you don't have answers? Time to customize versus speed in applying. It's a very good question. So my recommendation is to have a master resume that has everything you've ever done on it from the beginning of your career to the end. And as you come across job postings, you delete the things that are irrelevant and keep the things that are not, you know, that are gonna get you the job, or at least the opportunity to speak about the job. And then that way you are already prepared because you can quickly delete the things that are irrelevant and get back to getting it submitted to the ATS or to the recruiter or to whoever it is that you're giving it to. That way, uh, your time to market is a lot faster than maybe the next person. It's like, ah, I have to get my resume. If someone would call me today, to be honest with you, because I haven't updated in probably a year, I'd be in trouble because I've done a lot in a year. And so um, it would take me a couple of days to get to them. By that time, somebody else has got the job. That's the truth. So always try to get, keep yours updated if you're looking. Uh, Susie, sent me a question. Question. Susie sent me a question directly. He said, uh, how to get them past the ATS system and into a recruiter's hand. That's that's good. We're gonna cover that a little bit here in just a little bit uh, in a few more slides, but uh, to say also watch your formatting, we're gonna go over that a little bit, as well as uh, making outbound calls to those recruiters and making sure that they see your resume to that, to that requirement. And it doesn't hurt to do LinkedIn introductions as well. So what you need to know about recruiters Obviously, they can be a great resource because typically they are your entry point into a company. They can introduce you to hiring managers, introduce you to the right person that might be handling that rec, or uh, follow up with, you know, value add type things, right? So you can come back and, you know, um, circle back with them and make sure that they remember who you are. And maybe the position they're hiring for is already filled, but they have another idea for you. Trust me, at this point in, state, in, the, in the game, everybody that's... Um, in a recruiting position is, you know, excited when people do some of their work for them because it's it's a tough market right now and we're having people get jobs out from under us left and right. So in terms of agency recruiters, it's important to note that agency recruiters are more about speed to market and about getting you the right, right positions at the right time and timing is everything. So if you take longer to customize your resume or you take longer to respond back to your recruiter or you don't answer your text or there's things like that that happens on a daily that another candidate is going to get in front of you because that person responded faster or that person had their resume ready or whatever the case may be. And they're driven by commission, essentially. So they make a, a lower base and they do make a commission. So it's important to note their time is also money, right? And they are not resume coaches per se. They're more, hey, we're going to clean this up a little bit, but they're not going to rewrite your resume in general for you. Corporate recruiters, they can help you navigate the systems, understand the culture, know a little bit more about the managers potentially, you know, maybe a little bit more about the benefits than perhaps an agency recruiter might know. The difference, of course, for a corporate versus an agency recruiter is a corporate recruiter typically is not compensated on a commission basis. 
their compensation on compensate on annual salary and they have some metrics with regards to how many people they talk to how many people they interview and what their results are long term and how their turnover is based on the people that they hire it's radically different right they both serve each of their places because many times some of our clients don't work with a corporate recruiting department because they either don't have one or they're just starting up or, or there's some kind of alignment where it doesn't work for example Many accounting departments work directly with agencies because we have the beat on the pulse of what's going on in the market. And we typically can find talent that maybe a corporate recruiter might not be able to find because our job is to find talent. That's it. Our job is not necessarily to explain benefits to someone about a certain corporation or to you know, really work through that. A corporate recruiter is going to spend more time with you talking about culture and those benefits and selling you the company, whereas an agency recruiter is going to, you know, find you, isolate the, you know, find the skills and match it up, give you options and then move on. So just a little bit about how they can help you, like agencies can find you different spots. Corporate recruiters can help you get in the door with maybe a manager that, you know, you might fit better with because they know the personality is better. All right, a word about applicant tracking systems. Most of us know what parsing is because we typically upload a resume. Sometimes it goes in right, sometimes it doesn't. Typically, it's because of special characters and formatting is why it did not come across properly. And then, of course, we want to make sure that we really focus on the keywords that we put in our resume. There is a service, um, a website called jobscan.co. We've used it several times to help candidates really identify what their resume says about them and how they, like they're saying they're targeting a finance job, but there's all transactional accounting on their job, or they're targeting an HR job, but there's all you know, payroll on their job, right? On their on their keywords. So you really have to really focus on the job that you're looking for and try to make sure that your keywords are aligned in that. And of course, resume as an attachment, you can always attach the resume in usually in the applicant tracking systems as well. And then cover letters, if one is required, it is something that I don't utilize, but I know if their customer, if they require it, they're looking to see if you can articulate well, if you can write, a basic letter and put things some you know put together your thoughts on a piece of paper so that they can identify can this person you know do have solid written communication do can they articulate well what they're trying to say in a short concise manner some people i've seen write cover letters are two pages long way too long just needs to be one just kind of get to the point two or three characteristics why you're matched for the job my resume is attached etc so here's a cover letter sample to make it easy for them to see why you meet the requirements. So if you must do this, do it right. That's my point. So to the hiring manager, whoever that is, if you know who they are, right? Or if it's an accounting you know, job, there's accounting manager, controller, CFO, payroll, HR, et cetera, it can be IT, developers, all of that fun stuff. So whatever it is, the manager, if you know them, great. If you don't, then you know what I'm saying and then go through the job requirements, at least two or three, four is probably enough. And then of course, close with something simple, like I welcome the opportunity to discuss my skills and how I can bring value to your organization. And then here's my resume. So this could be a follow-up letter after you've applied through the ATS as well to XYZ manager after you've made a phone call into the system, into their company, or if you've looked through um, LinkedIn, you figure out who the job reports to or has a good, have a good guess, figure it out through email and send it directly to the manager as well. So I want to talk just real quick about one page bio and why we might be able to use it. An author by the name of Mina Brown provides guidance in her book called B Sharp. You get that on Amazon as well. And it's just straightforward, right? It's it's used for like speaking engagements, it's used for meet and greets, networking, those types of things. It doesn't necessarily tip off to someone that you're looking for a new job, but it also doesn't hide your accomplishments and your skills. So you're accentuating kind of both without being so obvious. So the difference between a resume and a bio, right? A resume set tells people, hey, I'm looking for a job focuses on work history and the details and all the credentials and your schooling, et cetera. And it's primarily used for a job search tool and it, you know, it's for everyone, right? Um, I've never not really seen a lot of, you know, entry level professionals use 
a um, bio, but I also have seen plenty of mid-level managers and speakers and executives use a bio when they're talking about whether it's business deals, investments, those types of things are just plain networking with other people that are at their same level. So of course it's less, less risk and it focuses on your major accomplishments and expertise. And it can be used for multiple different things. And maybe just as an introduction overall. Any questions about bios versus resumes? I feel like I'm going really fast, so I apologize. <laughs> I am. Nope, doing great. No, I did include the uh, sample cover letter in the book. And if you do get that book, if you do look for that book on Amazon it's called B Sharp, be sure to get the second edition because the second, second edition has like 30 different bios on the second half of the book. Ooh, I'm gonna have to get the second edition. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so characteristics of good resumes. Of course, the goal is to make it easy for the applicant tracking systems to, and the screeners, whoever's looking at it, to go quickly through your resume. Just real quick, if you'll put in the chat box, how many seconds do you think, or minutes do you think someone spends on looking at your resume? How many seconds do you think someone spends on looking at your resume before they decide whether they're going to move you forward, pick up the phone and call you, or toss you to the side to the no pile? Yeah, it's about 7.6 seconds actually. There's hundreds of resumes that are uh, received. And it's about 7.6 seconds. So you want to make sure that they can glance at the job, glance at your resume, glance at the job description, and go, okay, this one's worth calling. This one's worth calling. You know that kind of thing. Put you in the good pile. So the formatting is important. Overall length, number of years. Those three things are important. So. If you think about the fancy things that you see, I mean, they're fun, right? I mean, people can bring them in with them if they want to hand them to somebody. But my best advice is you keep it simple. That way, everything that they see in the ATS is exactly what they see when you come in. But I've, I've even seen pictures making a reemergence of on resumes. Don't do that, please. <laughs> Don't do that. It's not, it's not a thing here. It's definitely a European thing, but definitely not here. And then overall length of the resume, you don't want a five page resume, really needs to be no more than three, preferably two. And then the number of years, there's a couple of different opinions on this. My personal opinion is, is you go back 10 years and everything before that is other positions held, if they're relatable to the job. If they're not, then you just go back 10 years and just leave it. There's an argument for both. So there is guidance from Professional, Res Professional Association of Resume, Resume Writers and Career Coaches. They talk about having it easy to read, free from spelling, punctuation, and grammatical errors. I personally have had candidates lose jobs because they did not double check their resumes. Since then, we run them through a program that is supposed to catch all of those things. Although it doesn't catch, it's not 100%, right? They don't guarantee 100%. They just say, we'll catch most. And we, we can identify those errors before it happens. But, and it was simple spacing and punctuation. It was a comma and two spaces. That's what blew them. And they were, in account, they were supposed to be in accounting and that's what lost them a job because they didn't have enough detail experience. Spell out acronyms. Realize not everybody is from your industry. So even a recruiter who may be a recruiter, say for an example, a recruiter for um, a CPA firm may be hiring for a marketing manager. That might not be something that they hire for a lot, so they may not understand some of the lingo, right? So if you have a marketing acronym, it's always wise to spell it out first and then maybe in parentheses put the acronym so that if you reference it later, it's, you know, it's considered acceptable. And of course, highlight the skills related to the target job. And of course, include qualitative and quantitative accomplishments. And of course, please know graphics, pictures, underlines, extra boxes. It's a nightmare for ATS resumes because when it goes in, it gets it all squiggly lines and all kind of crazy stuff. And you might have your first job and your last job and everything all mixed up. And then it doesn't look well when it comes over to the hiring manager to evaluate. So key components of a resume. There's a heading, 
a summary, professional experience, education, and software skills. Sometimes you add key accomplishments, mainly in sales, mainly in um, high metrics oriented type roles, where it's important that you have those metrics there for someone to come back and evaluate whether you're a good fit for their environment. So under heading, real simple, very plain. I advise a little bit more. I meant to take off the, the Dallas, Texas and, and zip code, honestly, because I think that, in my opinion, whenever we go through this, I think it should be your choice as to whether you'll drive 30 minutes or 45 minutes and not an employer's choice. So if they think you're qualified, let them call you. You decide. And of course, no physical address, please. Let's see identity theft issues and other things that can come with that. And then summary profile. Of course, old days we used to do an objective. Why? I'm not sure. As I was probably 18 when a guy looked at me and says, why do I care what you want to do? And he literally just asked me that point blank. And I was like, I don't guess I ever thought about why. <laughs> so that's just how they told us to write them. <laughs> and he says to me, he goes, I don't care what you want to do in my company. I'm going to tell you what I need. And if you can fit it, great. And if you can't, then move on. It was a very poignant time in my life when I realized that, okay, maybe I didn't know everything about how to write a resume. <laughs> so I needed to work on that. But anyway, if we look at a summary, not an objective, it's important to use descriptive words that are powerful, impactful, and can concisely convey what you're looking for. For example, this is how it's written here. Innovative business analysts with a proven track record of documenting business requirements and communicated effectively, communicating effectively with leadership teams and customers. That's a mouthful, but it says a lot in just one sentence. It's not a run-on sentence, it's grammatically proper, and it sounds like you're super intelligent and you've done a lot. So diverse industry experience, including IT, manufacturing, telecom, travel, and finance, and adept at working across functional global teams in a highly agile environment. You can bet that the job description has many of these keywords in the job description itself. That's why they're being reiterated here. And if you look at areas of expertise, there's agile methodologies, relationship management, et cetera. And as you can tell, there's only nine. We don't need 15. We don't need everything you've ever done. What we need is areas of expertise that pertain to the job at hand. So just keep that in mind. Keep it down to areas of expertise that pertain to the job at hand. This is kind of when it comes to if you have a master resume, you can have all the things you've ever done, and then you pare it down to nine that match the resume best, I mean, match the job description best. That way, you're only deleting, you're not handwriting in every, every single time you have a new job. All right. And of course, I've seen a lot of functional resumes. I'm not sure who had that idea. I, it's not something that's useful for my, my line of work uh, because we always have, all of our clients always say, well, but where were they? <laughs> when they did this job, where, where were they when they did this implementation? And where were they when they did you know, this communication? And when they achieved this goal, because a functional resume is just a list of accomplishments, right? And some skills in general. And then it has the different companies that work, you know, you work with with no no real identifiers. And so when you look at that, it really can be confusing for someone who's not used to seeing it. Um, so please make sure that you do it in chronological order, make it easy to read, and that the parallel verbs where it's an appropriate tense, right? Because a lot of times people will interchange them in the same job. They'll put past tense and present tense. It's not, that's just not proper English, right? So you do your current job, it's current tense, everything else is past tense, right? So I know it seems straightforward and maybe most of you know this already, but if, if you didn't, it definitely can make, a game, make it be a game changer when somebody's looking at your resume. Professional experience and details. You know, I've seen resumes that the first job that they've had or the most recent job that they've had literally takes up the entire front page. And it just is an exhaustive list of everything they've ever done from like the time they walk in the door to the time they leave at the end of the week. And it's not, that's not the purpose of a resume, is it? The purpose of a resume is to get you a call, an interview, conversation. It's a marketing piece. So when we look at it that way, I think it can change your mindset and how you approach it and what you do. So the bullet should focus on results and it should not at all sound like a job description or just a list of duties that you've done, 
right? An example here would be reduced data migration time by 90%, eliminated errors, and increased stakeholder confidence by developing visual basic programs to automate the conversion of, and migration of data. Short, simple, sweet, what you did, measurable result, how you impacted the business, and move on. So if we focus on results, right? How they got to this, this data, this uh, point and how you really plussed it out is you can start with the, the basic premise of what you're trying to do and then ask a question, so what? Why does it matter that you developed visual basic programs to automate conversion and migration of data? Because really outside of the why does it matter, that's just a statement that's kind of, eh, it could be relevant, might not be, maybe visual basic is in that, maybe it's not. Right, and if you look at this, it resulted in reducing data migration time by 90%, eliminating errors and increasing stakeholder confidence. That says I've saved time, money, and increased, you know, you know, uh, production or increased efficiencies. And those are all things that potential employers want to see, of course. So, of course, enhanced text on focusing, you know, enhanced te the text on focusing on the results. When it says reducing the data migration time by 90%, you're giving somebody an idea. If it took an hour, then now it only takes 10 minutes or, you know, as an example. Another thing people really struggle with is multiple roles at a company. In years past, I think people just listed the company, the, the title, first, you know, start and stop, that kind of thing. What it does to an ATS, though, is it makes it look like your, your job hobby, that you're, you're chopping up your experience. It, a lot of times, even when I look at a resume, if I don't look at it, look at it, make sure that that's not what the case is, then I just assume they had four jobs in the last eight years, which is not necessarily always bad, but depending on the client, my client might want somebody to have at least three years of tenure in your last, you know, last couple of jobs or four years or five years, they actually ask that. And so when you look at that and it has that, you might just dismiss them if you don't format it this way. So if you have your company at the very top, over to the right, your entire year, that you started like from the beginning to the end. And then you have your first, your most recent title. And then you list out what you've done. Remember, three to five, no more than eight bullet points. Next job that you had there. Next job that you have there. Next job. And then how we handle those, you know, as let's say the company here at the very top change names. Let's look at how we're changing names. So give the current name of the company followed by the old name, right? This is one way to do it. So XYZ Inc. was formerly ABC Co. Or you can give the old company name and then the date of the acquisition and the new company name. So ABC Co. acquired by XYZ in 2014. That way, if they go back, because it may be companies they haven't heard of or if they're not from the area, could be a number of reasons why it's important to do that. And then of course, education and software. You know, you want to make sure that your degrees are listed out if you've completed your degree. I've always said, um, if you're in pursuant of degree, you need to put pursuing degree, not completed. But if you graduated, of course, you're a bachelor of or master of or doctorate of. And then, of course, city, state, and of course, the full name of the school. And please make sure you do that in proper form. Whenever people don't do that, it makes them look like maybe they didn't really know what their school was named. It's kind of like, I mean, I see people just put like UT instead of University of Texas, which is crazy because I would be proud if I went to UT, but you know, or university or, you know, that kind of thing, you get the idea. Try not to abrogate here either. It's not time to cut corners at this point. So software skills, of course, you want to say Microsoft, whatever the software package is, right? Visual Studio, Adobe Acrobat, that kind of thing. You want to name it properly, what the, what the world calls it, is important. So let's look at aligning a resume to a job description. So as we look at this job description for this business analyst, and I, as I alluded to earlier, there are some different things in this, in this job description that should be highlighted. It, it can take a few more minutes, it's true, but I think you'll find that when you modify it with these keywords, you give yourself a chance to make more of an impact long-term because your results from your interview callbacks are gonna be higher. So if you look at this innovative, forward-thinking team player will have, you know, enhance the development of the product, the next line, documentation of business requirements, 
improves processes, cross functionality, things that are going to stick out to you, right? Researches and compiles internal and external requirements from sources, right? Multiple sources. As you see, business flow charts, there's different things that kind of highlight out here. As you can see, communication's big in this job. And of course, being able to work with design and development of different things and agile and scrum methodologies are there as well. You'll notice it does say Visual Studio and it does say finance knowledge is a plus. As you look at this resume here, next to it, you see innovative business analysts, documenting business requirements, communicating effectively with teams and customers. You look at cross-functional, finance, and agile, all in that first part. Remember when I said there was going to be time, you know, that in the job description, there was lots of information there. It's exactly what happened here. So you look at areas of expertise, agile, process flowchart, scrum, et cetera. I think you guys get the idea. And as you keep looking through them and get to the hang of this, you'll find out that there's going to be quite a bit of and we've already kind of given this away, what's the goal of a resume? You can go ahead and humor me and chat, chat uh, put it in the chat box if you want, but <laughs> hopefully you all at this point would say, what's the goal of your resume? And it should be to get an interview, right? Or a marketing piece, or to get to the next stage of hiring, right? So it's important that we know that that's what it is. It's not a legal contract or document that has to be you know, 10 pages long, it's just something short, sweet, and simple that enhances the ability for you to get a call back. What questions do we have about the resumes we've gone through so far, or the information we've gone through so far? Any? If anybody has a question, you're welcome just to unmute your mic and ask away. What are the what are the do you print resumes out or you you just scan everything online nowadays? It really depends on where I'm at and what type of job it is, to be honest with you, but mainly it's online. Mainly it's online. And are you spending 7.6 seconds on a resume? Do you sometimes spend a little bit longer? I mean, what what keep what keeps you uh interested in a resume? If I see a couple of things that are there that are worth like digging into, you know, if I see a couple of the keywords that I'm looking for. So for an accounting example, I may be looking for someone that's done um, external reporting or SEC reporting or something like that. So if I quickly can see that, I'm going to keep looking at that resume. See, do they have the degree? Do they have the experience? I'm going to go to the next level of screening versus if I just scan it real quick and I see no SEC or no external reporting, never even touch it again. You know, it's next, next. And you can do that really quickly. Um, although there are times when you could miss it, typically you don't, right? Once you get your eyes trained to looking in the right places, it's not something you miss, you know? Um, there has been a couple of occasions where I've gone back, you know, going through resumes, like, let me see if this person has it. Maybe I just missed it. And I have caught one or two that it was just kind of buried somewhere low. And so when I called them, I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, we got to fix this, you know? And when you find out that was like a big part of the job, they just didn't really like it. And you're like, oh, okay, this job isn't right for you. <laughs> so, you know, you just kind of have to go with each one of the different people. And, and then people are not resume writers, right? I mean, that's just not what we, we're not, not trained resume writers. That's just not who we are. And so as I've progressed in my career, I've realized that if we can, I go back and do a second look sometimes of a maybe pile, like if they've got good public company experience in this scenario, and maybe they dabbled in it, but just didn't say it on the resume, I might go ahead and give them a call if my first group doesn't work out. Does that make sense? Yes. If I can't find enough people in my first group, then I'll go to the secondary group. But typically, that's not the case. Typically, there's enough in the first group that you can kind of work with. So when you put a, a job posting up, how many applications are you getting? How many resumes are you getting for that? Yeah, it depends on the job, really. Um, for that type of job, you get almost no resumes. So you have to really go seek them now because they're all employed with those guys. Those SEC reporting people are employed right now. Um, but if for like an accounts payable job or an accounts receivable job or a collections job or medical business office, something like that, I mean, you'll get 200 resumes and half of them not a fit at all. Like they're not looking at the job at all. <laughs> they're just supplying. That one click apply thing, great for candidates, terrible for recruiters, you know. <laughs> yeah. And then 
Um, the other half will be about 50-50 that you might want to talk to. And some might be location-wise. There's a lot of challenges right now with remote, people wanting to strictly stay remote due to you know the pandemic. Um, and we're finding companies just aren't having it as much anymore. They're ready to go back to the office. They're done with you know, whatever it is they're done with, <laughs> you know, they're ready to move on. Um, and so that has become a bigger challenge now than it was maybe three months ago, right? Because three months ago, I think companies were still kind of like, well, I don't know. I don't know what we're going to do. And now it's kind of like, well, we're going back. So, but there's still a fair amount of companies that are doing hybrid and trying to work it out, you know, trying to figure out where the, where the happy medium is. Our company itself has gone fully remote with the exception of our, our operation staff. So our operation staff comes in every day, but our recruiters are in in their homes doing their job. So, so with more with more jobs being remote or more people wanting to re be remote, does their location really matter where they're living? Do companies only if, care? Only if, oh, some clients care, some don't. Like we have one client right now that we can hire anywhere in the U.S. except for California. Anywhere in the U.S. except for California because they do not want employees in California for a number of reasons, but, you know, regulatory mainly. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. It's just an, it's an interesting time to be in staffing. It's an interesting time to be looking for a job. It's definitely, um, I don't think it's for the faint of heart on either side. <laughs> you know, I think that it's one of those things that, you know, and if you really work with somebody that's, you know, working to help you, you know, they should be working to find opportunities that match your goals and not necessarily theirs. And I think that that is, can be the difference maker between, you know, maybe somebody, you got to find a good agency recruiter and find a couple of good corporate recruiters so you can be friends with, right? That they know you, they'll keep an eye out for you if there's something there, that kind of thing. How often, you know, so, I mean, you, you said, you know, reach out to the recruiter. How often do you get a phone call from somebody saying, hey, I'm, I'm this, I'm qualified. This is, I, I want to go in, I want to be interviewed for this job. Yeah, I would say that when I make a posting personally, like if I post, I'm looking for this type of person, I'll probably get seven to 10 calls within a couple of days that'll be there. About two or three are probably actually qualified. The other ones are, are reading kind of between the lines and hoping that I didn't list something that maybe that matches them, you know, which is fine. I mean, I don't blame them, right? But it does bring them back to my front, my front of mind, right? My top of mind awareness. And then if I have something that comes along, I have them right here, like, oh, they're looking still. Let's go, let's go find something for them. And then of course, I always try to give suggestions like, hey, I don't have this, but you might try X, Y, and Z. They get a lot of jobs like that. I don't. Um, and then of course, you know, we, we've had a fair amount of C-level clients um, lately in terms of we've hired a few CFOs and a few controllers and a few um, CHROs and that kind of thing, which is an interesting time because it's more probably than we have in a while. You know, because we used to get once a quarter, now we're probably getting them a couple a month. So okay. that, that's an interesting dynamic change as well for Dallas-Fort Worth. All right, uh, here we go. We've got a question. Do recruiters give priority to LinkedIn applications as they do to a direct website application? Depends on how they have it set up. Uh, some recruiters have their LinkedIn tied directly to their ATS. And so whether you apply through LinkedIn or you apply through a website, it's the, it ends up the same place. So there's not um, a quote unquote preference to be had because they don't know where they came from necessarily until they've got into it, into the file where it says the source was LinkedIn. I will tell you that if I'm looking at a group of resumes from LinkedIn personally versus Indeed, I'm probably going to look through the LinkedIn resumes first, then I'll go back through Indeed. Only because the types of jobs that I hire for, are those people are typically found on LinkedIn. That's the only reason. If I was hiring different jobs, it, it would be a different story, I would imagine. Okay, here's another question. How would recruiters usually screen resumes if someone is trying to change their field of interest and only have a few year, year, yeah, only have a few years of experience in that new role? It's a great question. Um, and so I think that there's a couple of things. One, you have to find people that are open to those things, right? And clients that are open to those things. And there's a, mixed bag of those people out 
Yeah. Um, I know there's a lot of people that want to go from accounting to HR, HR to accounting, uh, admin to operations, et cetera, logistics to, you know, supply, you know, different areas of the supply chain, that kind of thing. So I think that you have to find a good partner, meaning someone that's going to help you be introduced to the right people that would be open-minded to that because they do exist. There are clients that do are open-minded to people that I just want to good person versus I need somebody with five different, you know, technical skills in this area, because most people understand most managers that are have the time and the ability to train know that if you can find the right person, you can teach anything else. So yeah, I thought well, that'd be what I would say. And then prove that I don't know what you're what you're looking to do. Um, but if you have some specifics, um, that if you want to share with me later, I'll put my contact information up or um, get it out there. And I'm happy to just kind of look at what you're trying to accomplish and give you some pointers. I have no problem doing that. All right. Um, anything else you have here? Or do you want to go take a look at a sample resume? Um, well, let's let's go ahead and look at a resume. And then I was just going to, the only thing I had left was just to review what we've already talked about. So we'll All right, well, I'll tell you what, why don't you go ahead and review things and then I'll wait and we'll pop up the resume here at the end. Okay, sounds good. And what you need to know about recruiters specifically, just make sure you have a couple of friends, make friends, figure, you know, work out where you introduce yourself to enough people that eventually you click with one or two of them and just ask questions. Say, hey, I know I'm having either a tough time looking for a job or I'm passively looking if something comes up, would love to hear about it, that kind of thing. And there's nothing wrong with passively looking. If you're completely happy with you know, where someone, where you're at, or you get to a place where you're completely happy and you want to just see what's out there, kick the tires and check it out. There's nothing wrong with that. You're not being disloyal to anybody. You're just checking out the market and being loyal to yourself, actually. So keep that in mind, find some people that you need to, you know, know in that area and target the companies and places that you want to work. A word about ATS systems is really just about making sure your resume is designed for the ATS systems. Don't get fancy. This is where you want to keep it simple. Just keep it simple. I'll leave it there. And then bios versus resumes. It's always a good idea to have, a good idea to have both, right? Um, but in lieu of one or the other, I would have a resume at hand all the time just to make sure that you're ready if, you, if the need arises. Um, important characteristics of good resumes, as we talked about, good formatting, free of errors, punctuation, spacing, grammar. And then of course, have the five key components of your resume. Don't have them all jumbled and keep away from all the fancy pictures, graphics. I mean, it looks really cool, but it doesn't bode well for the intake into a computer system. So then again, remember the goal for the ATS systems is for screeners to get through more people and find the good matches for the job based on keywords. It is only as good as it's programmed. All right. Let's All right, so let's take a look at, we had uh, one person send the resume in and uh, here it comes, they took away their header information. Okay. So I guess let me sort of scroll down through here and then we can go back and offer some suggestions. Uh, yes, Susie, a corporate recruiter means internal to a company. All right, so that's the bottom. We move this over here out of the way. So let's slide back up here to the very beginning. Comments, suggestions? So one of the first things that I notice is um, I don't see like a measurable result in the first area, which is not necessarily a problem, except it might be something you take out something there. Um, and then in this volunteer group, this is great to help fill, a, to be a filler, right? It's a good, good filler space. I don't think that I know. So the librarian is what we've been most of the time. Is that right? I like that it's five bullet points or less, right? Most of the time. So we have this twice. A volunteer and then they got paid. Got it. Yeah, I think. Is that what happened? Oh, okay. 
So in this case, since it was really sort of a long term, is it better for this to have the dates, you know, 2011 to 2017, and then you can say that, you know, 2011, 2014 volunteer, and then 2014 to 2017, it was a full time mm -hmm. job showing that it's one longer term kind of thing. That's what I would do. Yeah, I would change it there. Okay. I do like the fact here's a good way, you know, talking about the name and that it formally was so that people can find that. And I do think that the, um, in general, I mean, the formatting is not, I mean, it's not too cumbersome there. You know, it looks like it's got good spacing. Looks like overall, I mean, I'm not going word by word, although there are some spacing issues on that third line of the Bain and Company. Oh, right in here. Between internet and page. Uh, third line. Oh, yeah, right here. I yeah. saw it. I saw it myself as well. I noticed it when it was on the screen. <laughs> yeah. So um, just real quick, what, what type of job are you looking for? Are you trying to go back? into information science or? No, I'm trying to go into financial services now and I sort of have that in my um, profile thing. Um, so yeah, and I've changed the wording based on feedback from somebody in that industry and adding more things into it that match the job description. But I, yeah. I still struggle with this paid experience and um, volunteer experience intermingled, I think it shows a better way to tie together the years that, you know, my years of, of doing things. But again, I have the problem where, um, you know, if I get in front of somebody, I can easily explain how I could do the job, but trying to get to someone, um, you know, the ATS kicks it out because I don't have recent experience and it has a hard time parsing the, um, the, it, some of the systems won't let you put in volunteer experience. They only want to see professional. Um, so I've kind of tried to work around that when I can input the information as opposed to it just taking it out of my resume. Um, yeah, yeah. I've, seen, I've not seen that before where it's taking it out. Um, that's interesting. Um, your, your best bet probably is to go through an, an advocate like a recruiter, an agency recruiter that believes in you or a you know, a company recruiter, an internal corporate recruiter, um, a specific role that I can think of in financial services. Are you looking to do like trades and deals like that? Or are you looking to do like, um, like a, a not that long ago, a bank was looking for a similar type person for your role, but to, to be housed in a legal department to classify and to organize and to file away their cases and to make it simple and easy to um, find again, if that makes sense. So yeah, no. reference, interesting, very interesting. Yeah, so I mean, those, those would be some ways for you to get into financial services. We get on that side of transaction, you know, documentation, compliance documentation, that kind of stuff. That might be a way for you to get in there. Now, what you ultimately want to do, I'm not sure because I don't think I've asked you that, but, you know, um, that might be a way for you to get around some of that and really target those types of roles and see if you can't, um, Get your foot in the door there and then maybe once you're there for a little bit then you can say hey i'd like to do whatever as well or in addition well to i'm it. just finding i'm having my mo most successful i attend south lake focus group and i'm finding out my most success is just through networking into the company and then getting a champion to bring my file my resume to um you know the recruiter or something and then you know talking to someone that way um but a lot of the the roles like what you were describing, if you don't have any financial services background, sometimes they don't see the translatable skills. So, and I have applied also at a couple of law positions I've seen where it's sort of um, not necessarily doing the research, but doing some of the other stuff in the research group. And I just haven't had luck with getting calls back on that. Um, and I didn't think that going to a recruiter made sense for me since I'm changing fields. I didn't really know who to target. Um, yeah, you have to, I mean, it really, it takes a recruiter that probably works in the field or mostly works in financial services and would have the ability to see the rest of it and not just, 
it'd have to take a career recruiter and not somebody that's just in it for the because it's easy to do right now because everybody wants a recruiter you know what i'm saying you need somebody yes. that's actually in the field for the right reasons and really trying to help people so i wouldn't you might it might take you a minute just like it is to find the right physician or the right coach or whatever right to find the right person but you know i think that that's for sure something that you should explore okay i'll, I'll look into that I, I feel like at this point what i'm doing as far as trying to have target companies and find people to help me to get interviews is the best use of my time because it wasn't working blindly applying at all. So yeah, no, no, I would recommend anybody that's trying to do a field change, you for sure need a champion. Yeah, you need to nobody, network your way in. I think what you're yeah. doing, I mean, that gets you the most conversations and it gives you an opportunity to, to let people know and then they'll, if you if they will, they will help you. If they've been unemployed in the past, they probably will help you. Yeah, and you know if they if they see and if you help connect the dots, it's like hey, I know. Say like for example, if you already know Lori is the manager over that position because of your research and your networking, you can say hey, Jane, I know that you know Lori, and you know or at least would you mind putting my resume in front of her? Um, here's the reason why I'd be a great fit for that job, or I think that I would be at least worth a conversation, and then. Nine times out of 10, what's going to hurt them? And sometimes there's an internal bonus for them for referring people. So, I mean, that you, do, you don't lose anything, is my point, um, by asking the question. And I think that's a, that's the way you have to go. And that's why I say, if you find a recruiter that can be your champion as well, you have both internal champions and external champions working for you. So that would be the best bet to change an area. Because it doesn't sound like you're hung up on salary or title. You just want a chance. Yeah, that's pretty much it. And the jobs I'm applying for, I have the basic um, requirements of degree, no degree, you know, the skill sets that they apply to it, because they are just so very basic and entry level. And so you would think that that would at least warrant a, you know, talking to of some sort, but it doesn't seem to translate that way. You may also consider um, working on a temporary basis, put your foot in the door um, for project work and see if you can't um, land a permanent role that way. Many of the people that I've worked with in the last, gosh, I've been doing this since 2007, um, in the last 15 or so years, some of the times when they were changing, maybe accounting to HR or what have you, they literally just, they had to take a step back and you know start with entry level stuff, but then they quickly progressed because the people can see, right? The managers can see that you're not entry level skill set, right? You may be entry level to that role, but not in your overall skill set. So I see that those things happen fast. Okay. Yeah. And I'm trying to hunt down those opportunities. Somebody this morning told me about something like that with one of the companies I've been targeting. And I, it's a hidden market that um, it's not clear to find or see. So um, yeah, as I proceed down this road, more is, is coming to me. Yeah. Feel so, free to uh, message me. And if I have any contacts at the company, I'm happy to connect you to. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Right, we have a couple other questions in the chat box. Should we use Times New Roman or Calibri or what kind of font do you recommend? Calibri is the one that I, uh, or Calibri, I think it's said both ways. Um, that's the one I recommend and usually 10 or 11. Okay. And probably because it's plain because there's no serifs on it. There's no little right. extra points. So clean and easy to read. Uh, another question, do you deal with banks and uh, financial tech firms in New York City, or are you just based here locally? I um, I do have some people that are in New York, um, but they're, one of their bases is here. So I would be happy to uh, take a look. And if I can help, I'm happy to help. OK. Um, any hot jobs you're trying to fill right now that you'd like to tell people about? You know, I have an HR generalist role that is a remote role. Um, it is, uh, you do have to have two years worth of full cycle recruiting experience as well, because they're looking for somebody who can do both recruiting as well as hold down the HR fort for a technology company. And that is going to pay in the uh, 80 to 85K on the permanent basis. And on the temporary basis, it does pay between 70 and 75. And then I do have a senior accountant, real estate, uh, looking for someone who can who has yardy experience, and they're going to pay ninety to hundred k for that role. Must be a degreed accountant with at least five years of experience doing financial reporting. So I'll say those are my two hot ones right now. Okay. 
So that sort of leads uh, just one more. We'll just I'll ask you one more question. I'll let you go because I know you're very busy. Sure. Thank you for your time. No, you're good. You're good. Uh, when let's talk about the salary question because I know this was all about resumes and we were in, we, you know salaries is a whole different ball game. But yep. when a company reaches out to you, you're a third party recruiter. Company comes to you saying, "I I need somebody who can fill this role." Uh, do you always know what the pay scale is going to be? How do you share that with prospective employer or employees that reach out to you? What's that dialogue like? Usually our client is um, informed, but when they're not, because an example, you know, I'm, I've got a client that came to me and wanted a senior accountant at you know, about $30,000 below market. And I just told them, I mean, yeah, we can, we'll work it but I just want you to know what you're saying. You say you want somebody that's willing to take less, but why are they willing to take less? You know, you have to walk through that whole thing, right? I mean, they either have been unemployed for a while and maybe they don't have the exact experience you need, but they're willing to take a lower rate because of that. And they're willing to learn to it, right? To get up to, you know, up to speed or they're not the person you need. <laughs> Right. So, you know, the person you need is, you know, 90,000 versus 60,000. And, you know, either they can or they can't. And then they have to be realistic about what they're going to get for that same amount of money. Right. And so on the other side, when we're talking to the candidate, maybe you do find the ideal candidate and they've only made 55K. Well, I mean, 55 to 90K is not realistic. I mean, I guess it could be but it's not in where I live, right? So it's usually, we can get you to 70 probably from 55, but to get you to 90, that's that's a very first, you know, very, very far jump. Um, and then in terms of, you know, those types of things, you just talk about who you recently placed and what other companies are paying. Typically they come around, right? Cause they start getting resumes that I'm like, well, this is what 60,000 will get you in this market. This is what 70,000 will get you in this market. This is what 80,000 will get you in, the, you know what I'm saying? You can show them examples and we educate them based on the position. So it's a little shocking sometimes when they, they have sticker shock a lot in the beginning and then they get over it because they realize what they need versus what they thought they had, you know, what they, what their budget was a lot of times is far away. <laughs> so. Uh, all right, one, one last question and then I'll let you go. Um, you've got a number of people who are, I mean, so this is a LinkedIn question. You've got a lot of people working for you at Next Step. How many people pay for the recruiting package of LinkedIn versus just sort of go and surf and find people randomly on LinkedIn? Yeah, so all of our full-time recruiters have the LinkedIn recruiter package. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Every everyone that is a full time recruiter now, if we have a salesperson that's in recruiting and 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 um, does sales client servicing as well, they don't always have it. But right now, I think all of our people do. All of them do. Okay. All right. Because I know there's some other firms out there who none of them have the LinkedIn package. They just surf, and it's just like, so how do you find out how whatever. Uh, would you put your contact information in the chat window? Because somebody's Absolutely. asking about that. Absolutely. That would be great. And uh, let me do, I'll share a few closing slides with everybody and then we will get out of here. Where's my mouse at? There we go. If you would like to get a copy of the sample resume, the sample bio, a sample T cover letter, uh, you're welcome to please send me a, uh, a res send me an email and let me know what you're looking for at resume at careerdfw.org, resume at careerdfw.org, and I will get that information to you. Uh, Aaron has put his contact information in the chat window now for everybody. Uh, Career DFW and Career USA, we're putting on training four days a week. Hopefully, you'll join us tomorrow morning at the North Dallas Plano Career Focus Group. We're going to talk about Clifton Strengths. Uh, it used to be called Strength Finders, but Clifton Strengths and Core Clarity. Uh, PJ Dunn's an expert on this and how to merge the two. So uh, if you can, please join us tomorrow morning at 930. Next week, next Tuesday, our LinkedIn presentation is with Kurt Vondemotter. He is a retained search consultant. So uh, he would exclusively get a job from a company who's trying to find somebody. It's usually never publicized. 
and he will go on LinkedIn. He pays uh, LinkedIn for the full-blown recruiting package, and he will show us what it looks like from the back end. And he'll show us what recruiters, what he looks for when he's trying to find somebody. So join us next Tuesday at one o'clock. Next uh, Wednesday, uh, the practice interview team will have a, you'll be able to watch a real practice interview. Uh, on Thursday, uh, the fourth Thursday of the month, we'll have a networking presentation. We have a different speaker every week talking about networking. So join us next Thursday at one o'clock. This session has been recorded. It is going to be on the Career DFW and Career USA YouTube channel. On the Career USA YouTube channel, click on playlist. Every video that I upload, I put into a playlist, which makes it easy for you to find. Uh, and then just pick on the list you want. Don't click on the video, but down below where you see that red arrow, click on view full playlist, and then up will come a list of the different titles, dates, and topics. And that way you can scroll down and see any of the videos you'd like to go back and watch. If you're not receiving emails about our workshops, please join the Career USA mailing list. The nice thing about doing that is that you will get the title of the day, the topic of the day, and most importantly, the Zoom link of the day. That way you'll be able to just open the email, grab your lunch and uh, lunch and learn with us every day. So just send an email to careerusa, the plus sign subscribe at groups.io and that will automatically get you on the list. Please remember uh, Career DFW, we're a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Uh, all Aaron's a volunteer, all of our speakers are volunteers. I'm a volunteer. Everything I've done over the last 13 years has been to help you land your next great opportunity. Please consider making a donation so we can continue to provide the services that we do. So thank you very much for joining us today. Aaron, once again, thank you very, very much for your time. Everybody thank you. else, have a great Thursday. And have Thursday a good stay warm. <laughs> Jeff, Jeff, I have a question about tomorrow. Yes.